it's recording. Okay, so uh, welcome to this workshop on thinking like a mathematician and a sociologist. Uh, I'm Ray Fry. For those who don't know who I am, I'm a new EOP counselor here. Um, not new to EOP though. I have a pretty extensive background in mathematics, specifically here at Binghamton. So I've taught at Binghamton in the mathematics department for close to 10 years now. So my job today from the mathematics side of things is to try to teach you how to think like a mathematician. Now, my job today is not to actually teach the mathematics aspect of it, right? We're not gonna be learning calculus today. The idea is to teach you the mindset you need to get into to think about mathematics, right? It's not that idea of just memorizing things or all that, it's about getting into a mindset that allows for mathematics to actually be thought of. Okay, so on that note, right, this is an attitude, a way of thinking, right? It's not a memorization technique or a quick fix for things, right? So I'm not gonna be able to teach you something to go into your math class and to automatically all of a sudden understand everything that's taught, right? It's an attitude or a way of approaching that technique, okay? So in my section of the presentation, we're gonna actually talk about how do we think mathematically and then how do we do problem solving? Because obviously that's usually the spot that most people struggle with in mathematics, right? Actually approaching a problem. Okay. So how do we get into the mathematical mindset, right? How, is the, how are we going to do this? Well, first of all, it's to be active in mathematics, right? Think for yourself, right? Mathematics isn't something that necessarily can just be read or be taught, for, for instance. We think of it that way because the only time we ever approach mathematics is in a class, but it's a way of thinking, a way of approaching things, and to be honest, it's a struggle. I, I like to tell this story because after I bring up the idea of mathematics and what my background is, people think that I must be some sort of mathematical genius and I must really, really love mathematics. Okay, I like mathematics, right? But there are sections of mathematics I don't like. I'll be honest, I'm not the biggest stats person, right? So if you're a person taking a stats class and you're struggling a little bit, I feel you, right? I'm not really a big fan of that, right? I've also failed math classes at Binghamton, okay? I'm not some sort of perfect mathematician, but, right, I do know the way to think about mathematics that allows me to get through most problems. So again, math is a struggle. You're not always going to have all the easy parts. Be prepared to be wrong and be prepared to fail. Now I'm not telling you to fail a whole math course, right? Because we don't want that to happen. But be prepared to make mistakes. Be prepared that the first thing you're going to try isn't going to work, right? You need to try things that don't work to eliminate them from the possibilities, okay? Question everything. Right? And I like to tell my students this when I've taught the different math classes, is I want you questioning and asking why. If I put a formula up there, don't just assume that it's all of a sudden real, right, and correct. Ask me why. Figure out where it comes from. Right? Don't believe the first thing somebody tells you. Right? Make them explain. Right? That's part of that mathematical way of thinking. Where did this come from? All right. So question everything. Right? When we do come to problem solving, observe first. Right? We all want to jump in and get the answer right away. Probably not the best way to approach that. Right? It's a problem for a reason. Okay? The answer is just not going to magically fall out. Observe the situation. Right? What is known? What is unknown? That's the skill that a lot of times word problems are trying to teach you. Right? We're not actually teaching the math and right, trying to figure out the math. We're teaching your ability to observe an issue and attack that issue. Don't memorize, seek to understand. When it comes to mathematics, everybody wants to memorize. And in fact, if I asked everybody in this room right now to recite your favorite math formula, you probably have one memorized right now. I even do. I have one that's to the tune of row, row, row your boat, okay? But okay, we don't want to just go through and memorize those things, because guess what? Our brains are fairly finite in the number of things that they can actually memorize. If you tried to memorize every single thing you needed for your class, you're likely not going to get everything. If you understand where those things come from, 
if you understand why that came to be, you don't have to memorize it. Right? You could do all of trigonometry without memorizing a single thing. You just have to understand where those things come from and be able to create them. Right? On that note, build an intuition. Right? Your gut instinct when it comes to mathematics is likely the way to go. Right? Don't completely trust it though. Because I've had kind of both. You have the people who go with their gut, right? And then sometimes their gut is wrong, right? You might be that person. Or you may, I always know I have to double check myself. That's the don't completely trust it, right? Sometimes your gut instinct is going to be wrong. But the stronger you build this intuition, the more likely you are to get that on the first step. It also is the way of going back to um, being prepared to fail and be wrong. The more you fail and be wrong, this intuition is going to get stronger towards the right things, right? So that intuition is a work in progress, right? Finally, collaborate when it comes to mathematics, right? Talk to other people. Math wasn't built by some random guy sitting in his room by himself, right? Talk with other people, throw problems at other, each other, right? I'm thinking of trying this. And somebody else might say, I'm thinking of trying this. Well, see which one works, right? Work together. Math is not a solitary activity. Okay. So on that note, right, how do we solve problems, right? Because we are now in this mindset. We're prepared to maybe not do something wrong. We're prepared to trust our instincts and where we may go with that, right? But how do we actually do a problem? Well, let's look at a problem, right? This is a nice, fun word problem. And I know you might not have brought paper with you, but I want you to think about this problem. I'll read it to you. And when you're working on it, I don't want you to focus on the answer part of it, right? We will actually figure out an answer to this. I want you to focus on how you're attacking this problem. How are you problem solving? So Ray wants to get a triangle, specifically a right triangle out of green fabric. That green fabric costs 50 cents a inch. He knows that one side of the triangle is three times the shortest side. The third side is seven inches longer than the shortest side. And he also wants to know the, or he also knows that the perimeter of the triangle is 42 inches. How much would it cost to make the triangle? Take a couple minutes. Think about how you might approach this problem. What are some things you may do? What do you have to figure out? So I'll give you a couple minutes to do that. And I know you don't, might not have paper. We can steal some paper from the printer. Yeah, we could. That would work. I won't, I'll try not to knock your camera down. Yeah. Yeah. Try it. I don't know if you want to try it off. Oh, pen pen? That's what I don't have is pens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the paper wasn't the only issue. I don't think I have pens on me either. I can go get some. <laughs> oh. As you're working on this, try not to focus too much on the answer. Think about how you're getting to that answer.
give you maybe another minute or two. Again, I'm not looking for you to find an answer about how you might attack this problem. So before I go through the answer, right, I want to know what are some things you tried for this question, some things you noticed about the problem, right? We could stay away from the mathematics per se itself, but what would, did you try for this problem? What's the way you approached it? So I wrote a system of equations and kind of okay. the variables, um, and then I tried uh, I knew that the shortest side, I just put that as a variable x, mm -hmm. and then the other relations, and I tried to find out uh, what would be the hypotenuse, and then use Pythagorean's theorem. Yeah. So what it sounds like in the beginning, right, you set up equations associated with the pieces of unknowns and knowns that you knew, and tried to find those missing pieces, right? Okay. What were some other things that were tried with this question? Or uh, types of things you may have approached it with? I first did the same thing. Same and, uh, thing. A squared plus B squared, C squared. Okay. Tried it that way. And then, I don't know, I haven't taken a geometry class in 25 years, so I was trying to figure out, is the perimeter half base time site? We can answer that in a minute. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll see. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know if it was, but that was another... Yeah, but what it sounds like you're trying is you were going back to things you already knew, right? Yeah. You were saying, I know some formulas that have to do with triangles. Let me try and utilize those in some way. I've seen questions in the past that related the sides of triangles, right? It's a great way to do it. Did you have anything you wanted to share? It's up to you. <laughs> uh, I made a small triangle because uh, when it gives all the uh, measurements, it all involves the uh, small side. Very nice. Uh, yeah. So what it looks like you kind of started with, or what you added to what we already have, is you drew a picture, right? We're clearly representing something with geometry, so maybe a picture would work, right? All great ways to problem solve. And to be honest, we didn't even get close to the answer yet, right? This question was chosen because there's lots of different things going on and lots of different ways we could potentially approach the problem. So I'm going to combine some of what you guys did to help get us to the answer just because I'm sure it's nagging at some people. So I'm going to start with a picture as well because geometry is involved. So this is in fact a right triangle. So we have our triangle. All right. Now going back to some of the things we know, we know that this is also a right triangle. Okay. So we have this right triangle. And as was already mentioned, we have some knowns and unknowns in this question. Right? It seems like a lot of this goes back to the shortest side not being known, but there is some sort of relationship that goes back to it. Right? So let's associate a variable with whatever we expect the shortest side to be. I'm going to call it S, just for the fact that it's the shortest. Right? And as was already mentioned, we could maybe set up some systems of equations here with those pieces. Right? We know that one side of the triangle is three times the shortest side, so maybe we call that 3s, 3 times the shortest side. Okay. And we also know that there is a third side that is 7 inches longer than the shortest side. So that would be the shortest side plus 7 more. That does in fact give me the three different sides represented in the triangle. Okay. Now going off of what Ryan said, there are relationships for those sides. Right? We have things like a squared plus B squared equals C squared, the Pythagorean theorem, right? We also have been given a piece of information here, the perimeter, right? We know that the perimeter is 42 inches. 
So maybe we can utilize that to somehow combine these equations together. Now perimeter for triangles is just adding up all the sides, right? So we could take all those sides together, the s, the 3s, and the s plus 7, add them together, and that should give us that 42. Hopefully this can help us figure out one of our unknowns. Right. So s and 3s and s, that's going to give us 5s plus 7 equals 42. Subtract the 7 over to the other side. Would that be 35 if I'm doing my math in my head right? Divide both sides by 5. S is 7. I was thinking of area, right? You were, and we're going to need that anyways. Yep. So. <laughs> so we have that 7 inches for our shortest side. Now 3s is going to give us one of the other sides. That's going to be 21. And then the s plus 7, which would give us 14, gives us our third side. I could go through and change that up on our triangle with the way we have it written. We need another piece of information you know, might know about triangles. In a right triangle, the longest side is always the hypotenuse. So my original picture wasn't necessarily right, so I had to go back and revise a little bit, right? So s was 7. Now 7 plus s was 14. That's the next biggest one. That should probably have actually been here. And my longest side, which is the 21, is going to go on that hypotenuse. And from there, we have a final picture of this triangle. And a lot of times, students like to stop at this point. It's not wrong, we've gotten part of the way there, but that's not what the question originally asked us to do. How would it, much would it cost to make this triangle? So we also need to remember that we have something called area. And that's where Ryan's formula comes in. One half base times height. So again, using a piece of knowledge that we already have. By the way, if anybody's curious where this formula comes from, I worked with one of the other counselors this morning to tell them where this formula comes in geometry. We can always talk about it afterwards. It's very interesting okay, and not too complicated. But let's plug into this formula. One half the base is 7 and the height is 14. Half of 14 would be 7. 7 times 7 is going to be 49. Again, we might want to stop, right? But we have to check ourselves. It says, how much would this cost? Well, if it's 50 cents an inch, that's what we're going to use that in here. So the cost is going to be 49 times 0.5, right? And what that'll be, 24 and a half, $24.50. Okay. So when it comes to problem solving, you guys picked up on a lot of the things I was looking for, but let's talk about what the science says we're supposed to do for problem solving. So, it's called Poila's four-step plan. Understand the problem, devise a plan, execute the plan, and look back. Most of the stuff we actually did, right? So even if you didn't know the answer to that question, you knew the problem solving part. Okay. So, understanding the problem. Understand all the words and symbols. Symbols, right? Use your intuition. What are you feeling? Where is the plot I'm going to start with? Right? What do you know about the question and its conclusion? I know that a triangle is involved. Let me draw a triangle. I know that I have some formulas here. Maybe I have to use those. Right? I know I'm going to need a price at the end. Devise a plan. Right? That's where that draw a picture comes in. Use similar problems. Right? I'm thinking about all the relationships I already had for triangles. Think forwards and backwards, right? I know where I have to start it has something to do with the relationships to the sides of those triangles, right? But going backwards, I know I need a cost. And the cost per the material is going to be that 50 cents times the area, and that's going to give me the area, right? Work forwards and backwards. Finally, execute that plan, right? Break down this problem into the parts you can actually do. Finding the dimensions, finding the area. Utilize rules or formulas, perimeter or area that we brought up. And finally, look back, reflect, review, check. 
does my answer make sense? Does it make sense that that triangle is going to cost me $24? Yeah, it was 50 cents an inch, right? That's pretty expensive, right? What did I actually utilize? What did I not need, right? What spot did I accidentally use something that maybe didn't quite make sense, right? Review what we did and how that problem affected things. And that's mathematics, right? Pretty much any math class you want to attack can be done utilizing these skills. Any questions? Hmm? Now, that's um, mainly the thought process with computational math, but when you're doing like proofs, mm -hmm. it's still the same problem solving, but it's still so different. Like, how do you explain the difference? It is. So, like you said, the problem solving idea is still the same. What you're going to do, though, is potentially run through those steps over and over and over again. Right? So, I might go through my steps, execute a plan, get to the end, and go, uh oh, it didn't work. I got something that's wrong, or I know is wrong. That's that look back, right? I might have to say, okay, well, these lines are all wrong when I'm reflecting on it. I got to start back from there and start again, right? The proof itself then comes down to writing mathematics, right? And that's actually something Ryan and I have talked about for a future uh, talk is how do we actually write mathematics? How do we write that proof? But when it comes down to proof techniques, your process is still going to be the same, right? How do I understand what the goal is of my problem and what am I starting with, right? Because um, usually you assume something at the beginning of a proof and want a conclusion, right? So think forward, where can I go with that? What are some things that are associated with that? Same steps, right? You just might have to repeat the process over and over and over again. Other questions? Okay, right. then I'll pass it off to Ryan for the sociological. All right, well, thank you, Ray. Mm -hmm. Hey, how's it going? I finished you too, Nice. Here, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna have a little writing of mine, too, so I gotta get a couple more pieces of paper out. Okay, and also, too, one thing I did forget, I need you all to sign in. So if we don't have a sign in, Nobody has, nobody gets credit. So what I'm going to need you to do, write your name and your email. And if you're part of EOP or SSS. We're going to get pens. Oh, I got pens over oh. here. Yep. Thank you, Ray. Yep, no problem. Thank you. All right. So, Ray talked about what it meant to think like a mathematician. I'm going to talk about what it meant to think like a sociologist. And you may be thinking, well, I'm just in college to, let's say, just think like a student, get smart. However, the purpose, the larger purpose of this that encompasses both Ray and I's talk is that different disciplines demand different modes of thinking. So thinking like a sociologist is going to have similarities, a lot of similarities what Ray's talking about, but also differences as well. So the first thing that I always ask students is what is sociology? Who here has ever taken a sociology course? Anybody? Nobody? All right, we got one. All right, and this is what happens. I, I teach a sociology course. I've been teaching it for 12 years. Literally, everybody's like, what's sociology? I don't know what it is. Technically, it's the study of society. That's what it means as the you know, clear-cut definition, but what is it? So I got a couple quotes here from three very, very well-known sociologists. The first is from C. Wright Mills, who we're going to be talking a little bit more about in this. He says, whatever sociology may be, it is the result of constantly asking questions, what is the meaning of this? What's the meaning of it? What's the meaning of everything? What's the meaning of school? Why are we here? You know, what is the meaning of our job? Why, why do I go somewhere, I punch in on a clock, and I work eight hours, and then somebody gives me a piece of paper that I can then go buy food with? What is the meaning of our society? Pierre Bourdieu, a French sociologist, said the difficulty in sociology is to manage to think in a completely astonished and disconcerted way about things you always thought you understood. So. If I ask you, think of a ritual. Maybe that's 
Let me put it to you another way. Think of a graduation. You all graduated. But think about it. Did you really ever step back and be like, well, what's this whole thing with cap and gowns? Why are they playing this song? Why do I have to walk in this certain way? Who is this person speaking to me? And why are they speaking to me this way? We thought we understood, but the more and more we question, we realize we don't really understand where this came from and why it's happening. And Zygmunt Bauman said the task for sociology is, come, is to come to the help of the individual. We have to be in the service of freedom. It is something we have lost sight of. So here is the thing. The first two definitions talk about questioning the meaning of things, where the last one is saying, not only should we question, we should improve. After we question, how do we help? So sociology is not just a study of society. Society is composed of social relationships. So what is a social relationship? A classroom is a social relationship. It is the relationship between the teacher and the students, and it's the relationship between the students themselves. And we can go on and on and on to what that means. A protest, a social movement, is a social relationship. It is a relationship between people based upon a social issue, particularly a social problem. We also have, we've already talked about this, a graduation, so I'm not going to retread this one. And as you see, what, what's the commonality between these three pictures? What's the similarity here? What do all three pictures contain? Well, how do you visualize society? What is the base component of society? What's in all three of these pictures? People. So social relationships are between people. That's one way to look at it. But what happens when I throw you this zinger? That is a social relationship. It's a coffee mug. How's a coffee mug a social relationship? Or we can even let's let's use the let's use body armor. Drinks. And by the way, you can have a drink. You want a drink? No? Maybe not. So how is this a social relationship? Yep. Is it the marketing the psychology and yeah. the labels? How does marketing come into, how does this design come into being? Who's behind that? People. People. People in relationship with one another, deciding what, how that should look. What else? They're marketing towards um, what they think we might like, or what most society might like. Well, that's similar to what was said, but what else goes into it? Not just marketing. Did the, did the liquid in here magically appear? No. Oh. Who? The manufacturers. So they produce stuff? They mix stuff together? Where did the raw materials come from? Where did the elements of that drink come from? People. People. People mining stuff out of the earth. Or gathering stuff out of the earth. Plastic. It's made from oil. Oil has to be pumped. So all of these different things contain a social relationship. Now we go to the supermarket, we see this on the shelf, and we think that it automatically got there. By the way, we also need truckers to ship it. We need people to um, stock it on the shelves, things like that. We need cashiers to swipe it out, and we need consumers, i.e., us to purchase it and drink it. It's a social relationship. Everything you see here in this room is a social relationship. Now I'm going to get even more abstract on you. What about this? Materially, what is this? Well, it, that's the purpose. That's you what it is. It's, it's, yes, you can buy it, but we'll get to that in a second, but materially. Trees. 
Yes. It's a piece of paper woven. It was designed, it was cut down, processed into paper. It was dyed. So somebody had to create or extract the dye. Somebody designed this. All of that. So are these two the same thing? Let me ask you a question. How long before, how long does it take for me to die of thirst? A week. About three days. So I need this to survive. Maybe not this. This may have a lot of sugar and all sorts of other stuff I don't need. But I need water at least once every three days. What about paper? Do I need paper to survive? What can I do to, you know, think about the ways in which we survive. We need water, we need food, we need housing, we need clothing. All these things, that's the only baseline to survive. Yet this has become the most important thing. This is a social relationship because, Adam, I'm going to use you as an example, Hold that. You are the person who holds that property. I am the person who holds this property. I make a transaction with you. This transaction basically states that Adam trusts me, or Adam trusts that this is worth something. And I trust that this is worth something enough to go to Adam to purchase it. This is a system of trust. That's all it is. Once we start, stop trusting this, what happens? It, well, not inflation. We, we could get all into that. But it's worthless. It, it's, it's worth nothing. So if you ever see pictures back in the 1920s of Germany, they were burning money because it was worthless. All it did, and there was hyper, hyper, hyper inflation. But that's what this is. We have created institutions of trust. So it's not only the creation of the paper, but it's the relationship between people that give legitimacy to that. Also, sociology is social fact. So this is Emile Durkheim. This is one of the founders of sociology. He says a social fact is every way of acting, fixed or not, capable of exercising, on the individual, an external constraint, or again, every way of acting which is general throughout a given society, while at the same time existing in its own right, independent of its individual manifestations. You are all looking at me like, what did he just say? Now let me ask you a question. We're going to go back to the dollar. Did this, can you go out in the woods and find this in nature? No. This is created by us. We just talked about that, right? It's created by us. It's given legitimacy and power by us. Am I right? So we create everything about money, human beings. Let me ask you another question, and this is what a social fact is. Even though it's created by human beings, does this have power over us? How? How does this have power over us? We work nine to five to get that. Yeah. What happens if I don't have this? You can't buy food. You can't pay your rent or buy clothes. There you go. All the elements of our survival today are dependent on this. Unless you are a subsistence farmer who builds their own houses, grows their own food, gets your own water, makes your own clothes, all of that. So a social fact, in other words, is something that is created by humans through social relationships, but has power, exists apart from humans, and has power over us. That's pretty weird. Literally, we create something and we give it power, then to hold sway over us. So who are sociologists? We kind of went over what sociology is. Who are sociologists? That's a sociologist. He's the reason I'm here. So this is Professor Thomas Lambert. 
He taught me everything I knew. And he used to say, and I'm sorry, he did use gendered language. He says, the sociologist is the gendered, or the marginal man. And then a documentary was even made about him called The Marginal Man. And why did he state this? He said that those who study society are marginal to society. They somehow are outcasts. They aren't the ones who are, ex who are accepted into society. They aren't the social norm. Instead, they are excluded or exist outside the mainstream of society. And because of this, they are able to study society, social relationships, like an object. They have a different perspective where they can look at things in a different, unique way than anybody else can. Meaning, if you go to your graduation and you don't question anything, you just think it's normal and you're happy and everything, that's much different from somebody saying, why do I have to wear this cap and gown? Why do I have to march to this song? Why, you know, are all these things happening? The questioning, the questioning the assumptions of society allows one to become that sociologist. So I want to end with what's called the sociological imagination. This is by C. Wright Mills. And he talked about you can never really understand an individual unless you understand the society, historical time period in which they live, personal troubles, and social issues. We think that the social problems that are all around us, meaning all of society, are the ones that impact us directly. Let me give you an example. I grew up in a... Um, a religious, I don't want to say community, but my family, not my immediate family, but my other family was religious. So I had a fascination with religion. And I always saw it as declining because I saw everybody around me not believing in the religion. And so I went to college. And I said to my teacher for a mapping class, I want to talk about how religion's declining around the U.S. She asked me, do you have data to back that up? I go, yeah, sure, I know it's declining. I see it all around me. She's like, that's great, do you have data to back it up? I'm like, I'll go get it. I don't get it. It's a week before the papers do. Finally, I decide to look up, is religion declining in the US? And this is way back in 2002. I look it up, nope, the opposite is true. Religion's shooting up in 2002 all over the place. So just because what I saw in my own, you know, viewpoint, something that I thought was true, was in fact false because it wasn't the larger historical social trends that were happening. A lot of people in my sociology class talk about teenage pregnancy a lot. So where I'm from, Sullivan County, teenage pregnancy is very prevalent. However, if you look at teenage pregnancy rates throughout the U.S., they dropped like a brick. So I tell them, you are not adhering to the sociological imagination when you look at these things. So the sociological imagination is looking at how your life agency, your personal troubles, the biographical, relate to the structure, the larger society, larger issues, and the larger history of things. So let's meet Ashley. Ashley just enrolled in college and wants to take online courses. Why? Why would Ashley want to take online courses? Yep. Well, if she takes online courses, she can have a job and still do her, her college degree. All right, so work, school, life balance. Yeah. Okay. What else? Might not want to interact with people. Might be an introvert. Very good. Might be COVID season. 
Might be COVID season. All that stuff. So let's look at some of this. I'm going to concentrate on this side first. The individual choices. Life balance. We just talked about that. Study anywhere, anytime. I can do my work at 3 in the morning. No one's going to... No one's going to say anything to me. Self-paced learning. Instead of going to a class for two hours, I'm just going to study in 10 minute increments. Some courses are accelerated. Some online courses you could get through very quickly. Some courses, online courses cost less, can get a degree faster, and we already talked about self-paced learning. That's my mistake. I got to take that out. So these are all individual reasons why Ashley might want to take a course. But that's not the reason online courses exist solely for the individual. What about the historical development of the internet? If the internet wasn't developed as an entity, there would be no online courses. <coughs> the new economy demands new skills that need to be disseminated very quickly and efficiently to workforces. Also, we go back to work. It's not just me who needs that flexibility. It's that employer who needs that flexibility. Moral impetus, impetus for college education. Think about it. College has become like a rite of passage. It's become normalized. Like, if you don't go to college, you're like, well, why aren't you going to college? It's somehow looked on as abnormal in a lot of circles in the U.S. Why? As a sociologist, I wonder that all the time. It never used to be that way. Why is it that way now? Digital socialization. So becoming socialized into certain groups digitally is much different and important. Online courses is revenue generating. I love this one. If I run a college at just online courses, do I have to pay the light bill? Do I have to pay a maintenance staff? No. Do I have to pay a landscaping crew? No. Nope, none of those things. I just need a server, and that's it. And the commercialization of higher education. Again, it's a money-making venture. Do I think that my online students learn more from an online class than an in-person class? Absolutely not. I know my online students are not learning half of what they could be learning. But it, it saves the college money. And they're like, hey, keep doing those online courses. By the way, online courses, online instructors generally get paid a lot less too. So um, yeah, that's another thing. If you just teach online, there are chances. Like University of Phoenix, if you teach at University of Phoenix, it's like minimal money. So. That is the thing. It's not just about the individual's choice. It's about the larger historical social developments. So we can think of things, too, like unemployment. If I saw someone who was unemployed, what would my first reaction be? You didn't go to college. You didn't go to college. Get off the couch, you lazy bum. We start having these certain things. But what about the larger structural forces keeping people out of work? What happens if somebody was laid off due to that factory that they worked at being shipped over to um, China or Mexico? What happens if, you know, they're laid off because of, you know, robots taking over? So these are all larger social issues. And what happens when their kids decide not to go to college to make an item, but instead to program in a computer to program a robot to make that item? You see what I'm saying? You have shifts in the economy. School grades. A, B, C, D, F. Now, you yourself, you're like, i got to get an A. That's why I'm here. I'm here to learn more so I can get an A. Why? What's the purpose of grades? What's the larger historical development of grades? What's the larger social interaction of grades? Also, by the grade being there, are you caring more about the commodity, i.e. grade, or actually learning the material? <coughs> College degree, same thing. 
you know, all the world's knowledge is at your fingertips on the internet. Why are you paying thousands of dollars to be here? You need the degree to get a job. So we have credentials. It might not be education, it might be credentialization. So again, all of these different things, we are shifting between the personal want and desire, but also asking ourselves, why is that personal want and desire there the first place? And the sociological imagination doesn't look at one or the other, but looks at them intertwined. So when you leave here and you look around the world and you begin questioning things, don't just question your own assumptions about things, but the larger social processes happening around them. And that concludes that talk. I'm not going to go through this because we don't have time. So, oh. questions, comments, concerns, complaints, critiques? Myself or Ray? Wait, um, so you excluding themselves from society. But at a certain point, you, you can't do that. We're all part of this larger like, phenomenon. So like, you can't like completely exclude yourself. Nope. Is that just a limitation of sociology? It is. So there's this um, concept by one of the founders of sociology, Max Weber. He comes up with a concept called value neutrality, where we have to be objective in our studies. But he says, we're all, we all live in society. So we can't be totally objective. You know, think about this. I can try to be as totally objective as possible, but look at how I was raised. I was raised as a white male from a rural area in upstate New York. I've only read certain books. I've only met certain people. I've only gone certain places. My scope is limited. But he says, our goal isn't to be totally objective and value neutral, but constantly striving to be as value neutral as possible. So you are right. It is impossible to totally separate ourselves and devolve ourselves of all that, but it is a constant striving in the mind of a sociologist to do so. Anybody else? All right. Well, I want to thank you for coming. I'm going to go get some pizza. We'll have some outside. Um, I also got some snacks, too, so make sure to take them. I'll bring out some Ziploc bags if you all want to take some pizza home with you, too. I really want to thank you for coming. Um, I hope that this has helped in some sort of way in terms of thinking through the rigors of math, mm -hmm. or the complexity of sociology. You know, these are the types of things we want you to start thinking of, thinking through problems and thinking differently about different problems. I think if I took one thing from what your talk and my talk said was that in both, the biggest thing, I think the biggest thing we can ask you to do in college is ask that why question, right? Why are we drawn towards that body armor pro uh, product? Why am I being asked to memorize the quadratic formula? Right? Why am I being asked to take a math class? Why am I being asked to take a sociology, sociology class? Right? Ask that why question, because this is the point when you get the ability to ask that why. Right? Mm -hmm. And figure out where those things come from. So. Yeah, no, definitely. So thank you all. And I'll meet you outside. I'm going to set up the stuff right outside. <laughs>